Are you ready, kids? Hello, it's Employee Emilian, and welcome back to SpongeComs. Today's episode is Season 4, Episode 20, 420, or Episode 80 overall, Best Day Ever, and The Gift of Gum, both of which originally premiered on Nickelodeon in 2006 and 2007. Now, Best Day Ever is kind of an anomaly in Season 4 in that it's the only episode to be brought forward from the season 5 production cycle to season 4, while a season 4 episode, Nightlight, was held back to season 5. And it's also the only 11 minute long episode that was properly advertised as a special. It was written by Nate Cash, Tuck Tucker, and Stephen Banks, and this technically marks their first writing and boarding credits on the show, Nate Cash and Tuck Tucker. It originally premiered on November 20th, 2006, after a 100-episode marathon. About 100 episodes were broadcast in order to hype up not just this episode, but the network premiere of the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. And there was so much promotion for this episode. There was an online game, and there was a CD full of similar sort of bubblegum pop tracks. Sort of like the Best Day Ever song, which was written for the credits of the first Spongebob movie, but then two years later they decided to make it its own episode for whatever reason they so desired. But Nick really liked that idea and really hyped it up. But I don't think this episode, even if it was one of the best, would be worth that much hype. I personally think that whole Best Day Ever campaign and marathon was a bit of a jump-the-shark moment in terms of Nickelodeon's special treatment of Spongebob. Like, before then, you'd get about one special a year, but from Best Day Ever onward, you'd get two or even three a year. And it just sort of seemed like it was getting hard for the show to catch up to the hype that it had. it was building up for itself. Like, these specials in the post-movie era were tripping over each other and not really doing enough individually to recapture the simple charm of the original seasons. Now, there is a video about this whole marathon and the episode itself by a YouTuber called Paper Dawn that I'd recommend that goes over a lot of this information. And I don't necessarily agree with her on this being a bad episode or where Spongebob gets irreversibly bad. But yeah, it was definitely a turning point for the health of the franchise and the shift of its reputation from being a good all-ages series to just something to put on for the kids. And this wouldn't really be so bad if the marathon wasn't kind of screwy in retrospect. Okay, for one thing, nearly everything in the top 10 was season 4 episodes and... I could kind of look at that as recency bias, you know, kids were voting for all of this on Nick.com, and these were the newest episodes to them, the freshest, and really to show how much recency bias could be the cause, you do have uh, the camping episode as the only pre-movie episode in the top 10, and even that aired in April 2004, because with a lot of other stuff, They must have been watching them forever and ever and getting all the jokes. Whereas with these newer episodes like New Leaf and Karate Island, even if, you know, in retrospect, they aren't that well liked. At the time, those were new jokes for them to learn. I'm just trying to justify it in my head because it is really difficult to justify About 21% of the list was season 4, and there are a lot of classics that didn't make the list. Like, if you made a top 100 Spongebob episodes list today, you would have so many people on your case if you didn't have episodes like Ripped Pants, Squidville, Shanghai, Frankendoodle, Club Spongebob, and Can You Spare a Dime? And those were snubbed, they didn't make it on the list. And Band Geeks was only at number 38. And honest, that is such a hard thing to process that at one point, Band Geeks wasn't indisputably, you know, 
the magnum opus of Spongebob. It went below the great snail race. It went below all that glitches. And, you know, maybe it's just kids not having super refined taste, but I doubt this was Nickelodeon just trying to hype up, you know, the newest episodes again, because, you know, I don't think that they're that cynical when it comes to, you know, newest Spongebob is best Spongebob. They want to keep it going as long as they possibly can, but I think even by this point that they knew the value of those early seasons compared to the new stuff that they're putting out. But uh, there was a second chance for a top 100 list in the UK in 2012, and, you know, by that point, the early seasons were less than half the show, like, about 44% of that list was episodes from the first three seasons, which isn't that bad considering there, there was about 60 half hours in those seasons and there was about 170 that were available to UK audiences at the time. But on the other hand, I look at that list and there are some, there are some very strange picks like Big Sister Sam ranked at number seven. What is wrong with the British sense of humor? I, I, I've been talking about this marathon for like five minutes, but honestly, it did play a big part in, you know, the transition of SpongeBob's audience from, you know, an all ages thing to feeling a bit more like a kid's club. And, you know, I'm not necessarily the biggest SpongeBob fandom historian, but it did sort of feel like the vibe changed around the time the Best Day Ever Marathon happened. And what's funny is, the Best Day Ever Marathon sort of had to accommodate for some other Spongebob stuff around this time that didn't quite fit the mood of the Best Day Ever Marathon. Like, you'll see some promotional material for Creature from the Krusty Krab, which was a video game that released on most major consoles, except for the Xbox consoles in October 2006, just before the Best Day Ever Marathon. And that that must have been a big jump because that is a fairly edgy feeling game by Spongebob standards with a sort of rat think aesthetic and, you know, it being set in a nightmare world. But then a month later, it's all happy and sunshine, all of these Frutiger Metro visuals. And you had Patchy hy- hyping up the whole thing on a boat during the commercials, but uh, silver lining to this marathon is that the movie had its TV premiere on the network on the same night that Best Day Ever premiered. So it is kind of ironic that Best Day Ever was promoting a movie that had Best Day Ever in the credits. And uh, it was a fairly successful marathon in terms of reception because it got 6.7 million viewers Don't look at the three-digit figure, it is a bit more of an omen. And then a month after the marathon, uh, on December 12th, 2006, Spongebob was renewed for its sixth season, ahead of the fifth premiere. I know this is technically a season five episode, but, you know, season five was set to premiere in February, and here's Nickelodeon saying, oh, six is already in production, and Saima Zagami in a sort of press release for that renewal didn't have the, you know, the least patronizing words to describe SpongeBob and what it represents for the Nickelodeon network, but I might get around to those when I get to season six, but there's a lot to digest about what SpongeBob was going through at the end of 2006 and how it sort of laid the groundwork for a different feeling for the show, as as most of season four, as I've been over in all these sponge comms, but I've been talking a lot about the context behind this episode and why it's so maligned. But in terms of the actual content of the episode, there really isn't much to say. Uh, In terms of, like, extra stuff that you know, makes it stand out. I think this is the first or one of the first episodes that got some extra shorts for the DVD releases. So 
whenever Best Day Ever was released on DVD for a while, you'd get these like three or four bonus shorts that are set around the context of, I don't know, a good day. It's a bit hard to explain, but uh, starting in season five, they would, you know, promote these specials by including a few shorts, which I guess were supposed to air during the breaks, but now they mostly circulate on the home media releases whenever those were coming out. Um, so, Best Day Ever is now wrapping up, but what do I like about this episode? Well, a few things. I'm not necessarily a big Best Day Ever hater, but there are some things that I do like about this episode. I say this about every episode, but it is especially true here, because this episode is themed around a song that I like, I don't know if I still call it one of my very favorite Spongebob songs, but it is kind of interesting that they go all this way to give it, you know, a second lyric, even though, you know, for a couple years now you've had a sort of three minute version that has sort of a bridge and stuff. But yeah, it is kind of an interesting idea to theme this around a song that had already been released in pre-existing media. But honestly, I don't think they knew where to go with it. Like, everyone has made the criticism that the plot of this episode is kind of pointless because it's all about Spongebob wanting to do things with his pals. He's got a whole perfect day lined up for himself where, you know, he goes to the Krusty Krab, does karate with Sandy, jellyfishes with Patrick, and then attends a recital with Squidward playing the clarinet to an oddly big crowd, even though no one likes some clarinet playing. And, you know, the, the big problem people have with this is the context behind SpongeBob being, you know, this is stuff he does all the time. I think the intent is that this is the first day all of this is happening, but it's not conveyed well in the narrative. And as such, you know, his sadness upon you know, this day going wrong every step of the way, you know, it, it seems disproportionate and childish to have this sort of reaction to what's going on. And, you know, even if they did make it clearer in the text that this is all supposed to be lining up the right way, it still wouldn't really be SpongeBob's brightest hour as a character. But this is a show about happiness. This is, like, that's my three-letter condensed description of the whole Spongebob TV series. Show about happiness. So, yeah, I see why they wanted to do an episode about having such a good day and it going wrong. But the emotional core in this episode lacks dimension. Like, I'm not as hard on this episode as others, but... You can still feel the overhype, but it, it, it's overhyped and under good. That's what I'll say about Best Day Ever, even though I'm about a minute into The Gift of Gum, which originally aired February 19th, 2007, and was written by Zeus Service, Eric Weiss, and Danny McKelly. Season 4 finale, and apparently Eric Reese's final writing credit for the show, like the last time that he has been fully credited on a script... But he's still done some storyboarding here and there for Spongebob Media since. But after The Gift of Gum, I think he was off co-developing The Mighty Bee, which was another Nicktoon that premiered a little bit after Season 4. What I find odd about this episode is that no one really loves it. It's not, you know, it, it's one of the first major gross-out episodes where a big chunk of the episode is... It only exists to make a character feel grossed out, and because these characters are so identifiable, it just grosses out the audience. So this episode doesn't have, you know, the biggest following per se, but it represents the season on the cover and menu of the Volume 2 DVD set, which released a month before this episode aired, and the full compilation, which released in 2012. So... I feel like whenever people pick season four up on the shelf now, they see, you know, the big wad of gum and everyone's stuck in it. And that just sort of 
represents the season to them, just sort of the point where it starts to become more about, you know, gross childish gags, even though I don't think that it's a good representation of season four in general. There's a lot of episodes that they could have picked, but just didn't. Silver Lining is, for a lot of other regions, the full season released earlier in 2008 as a three-disc set with the Volume 1 cover, so you've got a boating school aesthetic, even though, you know, boating school only appears in two episodes. Still better than a giant wall of gum, I'll, I'll say that. And what's funny about these covers is that Mr. Krabs and Plankton are featured on them despite not appearing in The Gift of Gum. You know, it's just Spongebob, Patrick, Squidward, and Sandy at the end. And I think this volume two release was the last DVD, well, one of the last, maybe the very last, where they had Plankton sneaking around on the back cover, which used to be a cute thing to look out for whenever you got a new Spongebob DVD, but I guess just drawing Plankton is too much hard work for the DVD folks. So yeah, just with all that preamble out of the way, this episode is just kind of lame. I mean, I don't hate it. This is definitely a very mid selection of episodes to go out with for season four. I think what puts it above other gross out episodes in the post movie era, the, the two I'm really going after in this are Fungus Among Us and The Splinter, because they're just some of the most infamous and some of the easiest to point to as, you know, where they took gross out too far. What separates this from them is that Patrick's giant wad of gum, Gummy, is only at its grossest in the first leg of the episode, about the first half of it, whereas then it just becomes this sort of amorphous bunch of pink nothing, whereas in this first half they're showing just how it's smelly and full of saliva and moldy food it is and that is just such an unpleasant thing to base an episode around even if I do really like the friendship day theme and the idea that Patrick gives Spongebob a gift that doesn't you know Spongebob doesn't like after a while I do like how we do see a little viking hat come out of Spongebob's uh, closet there off screen you know happy Lee Ferrickson day whenever that's celebrated again so yeah, from about this point forward, we don't see any, you know, leftover trash in Gummy. Some hair here and there, but, you know, it's not as, you know, much of a pile of garbage as it is a pile of pink stickiness. The context of what Gummy is changes at this point in the episode. And I like this gag of, you know these people who have been lost in here for a long time. Just a very strange direction to, you know, take the episode in before it goes in another direction of, you know, what if gum was sticky, you know? What if it stuck around everywhere? Um, there's some other trivia about this episode. Uh, you know, it is... This has been a good Sandy season. We've seen a lot of, you know what her interests are and what she likes about Bikini Bottom and, you know, getting to see her in the final episode they chose to close season four out with, you know, that is kind of nice. Even if, you know, she does very little and only makes the problem with Gummy worse. So even though he isn't listed as a guest star or anything, uh, Vincent Waller, who was sneaking his way to being the creative director of the show, voices two characters in this episode. One of them, he voices Patrick's underwear, you know, the creepy, you're not Patrick, voice. I, th I think, you know, if someone asks him, you know, oh, you work on Spongebob, oh, you've done a voice on Spongebob, he'll do that voice to them, I, I like that idea. And he also voices this very loud, angry truck driver coming up, you know, very loud and angry, you know. Interesting character, even though he's only got about two or three lines, which I think is why he was chosen, you know. 
if they needed a retake, he could do that pretty quickly. So even though after all this gum sticking everywhere and SpongeBob and Patrick mending their Friendship Day troubles, it does end with this montage of Patrick eating all the gum again and then blowing a bubble that encases Bikini Bottom, which is quite a downer ending. And if season four happened to be the last, that would have been a pretty dark way to end the show. I did a standalone review of this episode a couple years ago and I hammered in how if this was where Spongebob ended, or if this season four is where you decide to call it quits, then that's quite a visual to leave on. It, it's quite a visual to leave a season on anyway. So anyway, as Patrick, you know, sort things out and eats it and destroys Bikini Bottom again, uh, I just wanted to address the fandom divide surrounding season four and the post-movie eras in general, because it has grown since I started SpongeComs, and I just wanted to address it in some form, in some way, and, you know, a lot of you are still watching SpongeComs, so hear this out. There is the whole, you know, there is this insult that comes up for people who don't like anything from season four onward, you know, the whole Sponge Boomer insult for anyone critical of the fact that the series is still around, and... You know, even though in some aspects I do fall into that, you know, I do just want the series to end on a high note and, you know, move on to the next stage in its existence, whatever that is. It's also like, with these long-running shows, I've just come to accept that they'll be around for a very long time, and the people who want to make them, they'll want to keep making them, and... It's sort of like being mad that Mickey Mouse or Looney Tunes is still around. I've just come to accept the fact that Spongebob and The Simpsons, South Park, Family Guy, that they're constants in the industry, and with the way the industry is headed, I'm cool that these eternal franchises are eternal, because if one of them goes, that's bad news at this point. But anyway, just about the whole Sponge Boomer stereotype... Just, here's my take on, you know, what counts as that and what doesn't. If you've given post-movie eras of Spongebob a shot, and you just don't like them as much, then fair enough, that doesn't make you a Sponge Boomer. Five years ago, you would have been the majority, and I think you still are. I think that to be an archetypical Sponge Boomer... You have to be pretending that you know better about what's best for the show than any of the original creatives did, and making anyone who likes anything made after 2004 feel bad about themselves. Because you're not going to look like a very pleasant guy, and or fella, or whatever, and you're just not making the first three seasons look good if you do that. You know, a 25-year-old comedy series can be hard to defend, but... I salute the Sponge Zoomers, or newer Spongebob fans, who are still watching and discussing the new seasons and getting the most out of it all this time later, because it's, depending on who you are, that's got to be either the easiest or hardest thing ever. I just wanted to say all this to mend the sides before any serious harm is done, because if you've been in the Spongebob community at some point earlier this year, you'd know, and, you know, we should just stop fighting and remember that we're all here because we like Spongebob. And I wanted to bring that up at the end of season four because this is a transitional year in terms of, you know, the reception and where the series goes from here. It's got some of the last flashes of that purely classic ideals, but at the same time, you know, you do see where the show is going to be going in season five and six. A bit of seven, but yeah... The post-movie era is born here, but I still like what they did during most of season four. I think for every episode that I'm a bit cooler on or just flat out don't like, there are two episodes that I really like. That's not like a firm statistic, but you know what I mean. I like most of the season, and as the first with a new crew, then I think that's a success personally. 
But that was Best Day Ever and the Gift of Gum. Last week I asked who your favourite jellyfish was, and a lot of answers. Sparking with Knights says no name or friend. Walpole and Walkester, Jeffrey Jellyfish and the King Jellyfish from I'm Your Biggest Fanatic. Jeffrey Jellyfish, the man, the legend. In Gaggle Nations, uh, definitely a tie between Jeffrey Jellyfish and the Gold-Throated Singer. Oh yeah, it's funny. Dashiell 777, I really like King Jellyfish. Captain B. Zah, his favourite is the Moon Jellyfish that appeared in the recent Mooned episode. I don't think I've seen Mooned yet, but I have heard some, you know, wildly different reactions to it, so I'll look forward to that. Um, you mentioned the whole, uh, you know, Big Spadina YouTube poop with Squidward, and I really wanted to quote that at some point in the video offhandedly, like, you know, I think Squidward's gonna be a great typist one day, but that would have been very strange, but I do like how that episode is very identifiable by just that old YouTube poop. It's still funny. It's one of the dumbest YouTube poops of its time, but that's what makes it better than most, honestly. Brendan Barney says no name slash friend. Bryce Fawn says the same. Uh, Carson Ibera, probably the jellyfish from Jellyfish Jam. He, they go over why they think Squidward doesn't work and posit a different idea about Squidward trying a ventriloquist act. And yeah, I see that has potential. You know, I can picture the episode you're coming up with in your head. Uh, Mr. Guy Goo says Jeffrey. Random Lad says the blue jellyfish and Jellyfish Hunter. No name. And SJM Hadsock says Big Lenny. You know, you speak my language. Uh, Cuppy asks, uh, when do you think your Gravity Falls review will come out? You know, that's taken a while, mostly because I'm doing sponge comms, but also because, it, you know, it's getting hosher and, you know, it's been a bit tougher to work. And Gravity Falls is, it just feels like a tough show to get right. And this f review is going to be a bit longer, but I hope... It comes out sometime next week, and I'm hoping you're all excited for that. My question for you for the next wee while is, what is your favorite moment in season four? Because there's a lot of bits and bobs in this season that people don't care if it's after the quote-unquote classic era. They're still hilarious, and, you know, there's a lot that I could choose from. I've never had a definitive answer of what my favorite moment from season four is so you know i might come up with one by the time that i'm doing spongecom season five but until february i want to hear from you guys because things might get a little less friendly in the season five premiere friend or foe goodbye for now we'll be right back